Did you know that most STEM graduates don't end up working in STEM fields? It's true. And it's not due to a lack of demand. We hear constantly about the burning hair on fire crisis level shortage of, of, of STEM grads. Tech companies dominate our landscape, ranging from everything from artificial intelligence to smartphones, searching the web, blockchain, and beyond. And despite the fact that these tech companies dominate the environment, the economy, and the looming global cries for scientific solutions from STEM fields, they're not losing STEM graduates due to a lack of funding. We've in fact poured billions into STEM programs. Yet, despite this, up to 70% of STEM graduates choose not to pursue careers in their fields. Some studies show about 50% of engineering grads leave before they even gotten their first job. So why is that? I had the incredible opportunity to communicate, to share these ideas with my UCSD colleague, who's a world-renowned sociologist, John Scrantney, who recently explored these issues in his wonderful new book, Wasted Education. I know it's not going to be a waste for you to tune in. So let's go into the impossible. John Scranton. Welcome to the into the impossible podcast where we feature for the very first time, a sociologist who is joining us all the way from the other side of campus. John Scranton. Did I pronounce it right? you, correctly, John? That, close enough. It's good enough. It's good enough. And that was a long walk. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I and mean, I'm, I'm proud to introduce you to this building. We've never had, we've had some socialists on, but we've never had a sociologist <laughs> on the podcast. Um, and so I want to start with a semi provocative question which is okay. you make the case in the in, in this wonderful book wasted education uh we'll describe the the cover art and the book title and the subtitle in just a bit but you make the convincing case that you know we kind of have this um very ambivalent very ambiguous message that we send to stem grad i'm a stem graduate and yet i claim that you know stem is sort of our best hope and i think you agree with it do we need more STEM graduates or do we have enough and we need more sociologist graduates? <laughs> I mean, where is the lacuna? Where is the gap in what America is churning out versus what we actually need? Is it in the soft sciences, humanities, or really in the STEM sciences? That's a great question. And I would say we need more educated people across the board, but I'm with you. We need more scientists and engineers, but the book is about how we need to treat them better. And too many are getting this great education and they're leaving and they're going to do other things. And so the book is really, it's kind of a mystery book, really. It starts with a puzzle. Why is it that the majority of STEM grads don't work in STEM jobs when uh, we hear constantly about the burning hair on fire crisis level shortage of, of, of STEM grads? So that's the puzzle. More than two thirds leave, depends on the data, but it's always a majority leave. And I wanted to figure out why. And the big story is they are just not treated that well. And I do think, and I'm with you, even though I'm a, a sociologist, it's the scientists and engineers who are going to save the world. Mm -hmm. And it's the policymakers who have to develop the right policies to allow them to do that. So that's why I say across the board, social scientists, humanities, anyone who can communicate well, will help develop the policies to you know, unchain the scientists and engineers or keep them using their skills so that they can save us. Mm. How do you react to this statement? I've, I've noticed, and actually tonight, I'm going to see the world famous San Diego Padres play at the stadium uh, down at Petco Parkway and uh, watch them, you know, flail and struggle to beat the Milwaukee uh, Brewers. Um, uh, odds are under 50%. I can't wait for this question because this was quite a segue. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> uh, I claim uh, we are doing the following. We in academia have set up a system mm -hmm. where to get uh, from graduate student to postdoc mm -hmm. is easier than, you know, me getting on a peewee, you know, football team or a peewee baseball team. Okay, mm -hmm. to continue the analogy. It's, it's actually very easy to even get a postdoc. There's mm -hmm. a, such a dirt. There's such a hot market. And then immediately it flips around to go from postdoc, which I'm going to use in the analogy of this and to the baseball of triple A baseball. So imagine like you could get into play triple A, which is almost literally it's it's almost a major league level caliber. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of major league players get bumped down to mm -hmm. get rehabbed and work off their drug addict uh, habits or whatever. I don't know what they do, <laughs> but but up in uh, up in uh, Escondido, they have a team up there. But to get from postdoc to faculty, we had a job search not long ago, 400 applicants, one position. 
are we not doing a tremendous disservice just within academia by setting up this false narrative that you're going to it's just going to be the same as making a jump from AAA to the majors when in fact it's more like making the jump from peewee to the majors it's almost impossible yeah that's a great question so just to be clear the book is mostly about the private sector mm -hmm. and you're talking about academia which i've still stem. yeah i still research yeah. that mm -hmm. and that's an important part of of the story here i've heard debates ab about this and that there's some folks who say we should get everyone give everyone a chance everyone who loves science has a passion for it has the skill set give them a chance but as you point out, that chance is minuscule. And just this weekend, I met a PhD in life sciences who was a postdoc, saw the writing on the wall and moved to industry, even though this person had a great passion for scientific research in the, the kind that you do. And so um, it's a tricky situation. And part of it is the story of funding and how expensive it is to hire a ladder rank faculty member. So I don't know what it, you don't have to talk about it, but when, when UCSD or any major research university hires a new professor, especially in the sciences and engineering, they get this massive startup package. They're going to get a lab. They're going to get all this stuff. And that stuff is expensive. And, and most of the grants are grants to do specific research projects. You have a deliverable at the end. It's not just grants to keep the lights on and, and keep the buildings going. Mm -hmm. So you've got this situation where these all these labs need worker bees. They need they need grad students, they need postdocs, and they need folks to make the lucky folks who got a ladder rank faculty job make their research happen. And and it's exploitative. There's there's no doubt about yeah. it. It's a rough situation. And so a lot of people after their second or third postdoc, they realize their life is slipping away. They're getting in their 30s or early 40s. Or they they still don't have a grant. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and they're and it's and so they luckily they can typically move into industry that might, might not be what they want to do. Mm -hmm. But it's a system that's it's I think it's kind of unsustainable mm -hmm. and a little bit exploitative. But um, but the, re the research universities, it's just expensive to run these things. And science, you know, I think is getting more expensive. You know, when you have to a quantum computer, mm -hmm. that's a hell of a lot more expensive than than computers were 20 years yeah, ago. The book shop, yeah. I mean. Yeah, and so anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely mm -hmm. true. I feel like we're creating a, what our legal friends would call like an attractive nuisance, basically. It's ba it making it seem as if, oh, you're just going to follow along this track and, and you're eventually going to get the job of your dreams because you are going to become me. And therefore, what could be better than being a professor just right. like me? I just had uh, two students graduate last week, uh, got their PhDs rather, and uh, one's leaving you know academia forever. Uh, the other one may or may not remain for a long time, short time. She has a postdoc set up, but it's become it's become become, you know, almost impossible to say with a straight face that this is the same kind of job that it was when you and I start. I started 20 years ago. You probably started around the same time or, or maybe maybe um, uh, slightly before or after. But uh, it's changed a lot dramatically. I don't think it's changed for the better. I, I think we've had a lot of bureaucratic overlays and a lot of this apparatus that's set up is not to support the mission of the university, which is education, research and, and so forth. It's it's you know, checking diversity boxes and doing all sorts of other stuff. But you, since you do focus on industry, I can't resist again being slightly provocative. Before we're going to get into the cover, don't worry. I know people love the judging books. We have to judge the book. I mean, it's it's too beautiful a cover not to judge. But before we get there, I'm uh, there's a trend on TikTok, uh, which I'm sure you don't watch. But I know you're on Twitter <laughs> and I will put your handle underneath because everyone should follow you. But the uh, the, the quiet quitting or, you know, mm. a day in my life at uh, at Google, you know, we start off, right. I, I drop off my laundry, I yeah. get my, my I get my espresso and then I get my oat milk. So I, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And anyway, it's this whole thing. And it's and it's so it's it's so, you know, it's such a trope, but but it really has gotten kind of out of control, especially in in Bay Area companies and, and they're cutting back. So uh, who is to blame? Is it the faculty for churning out the students? Is it the government agencies that have fellowships and programs and, and so forth? Or is it the companies that offer these, you know, seemingly extravagant perks, you know, but then uh, ultimately job satisfaction d doesn't correlate with the fact that you can get your laundry done in the in the first floor, you know, uh, laundromat. Right. So um, I just want to go back to the Padres thing. Yeah. You threw me there for a second, <laughs> okay. but it works well. Come on back. Yeah. It works well. But my my favorite analogy, though, maybe I'll use yeah. yours in okay. the future is is Hollywood. Mm. There's so many people who want to make it big in Hollywood. Yeah. And they all go there and they put up with all kinds of exploitative jobs and jobs that aren't <laughs> that great in the hopes that they'll they'll make it big. Yeah. And and similarly, sort of like the postdocs, 
I have a few friends who've gone into acting and they kind of bubble around, you know, they'll have a bit part in um, Grey's Anatomy or, or mm-hmm. something like that. They'll kind of bubble around and, you know, it looks like things might right. be happening. But they don't and, even have health insurance. <laughs> yeah, they don't, have, they don't have health insurance and they're, you know, there's enough hints that they might make it, but yeah. then how long do you do that? Right. Just like these postdocs. Right. Mm-hmm. But so this, this other question, there might be a few jobs like this where you hang out in a meditation pod on Google's Dime. But people leave those jobs. They, they, it's a young person's game. There's so much to say about this. I'm kind of tripping over yeah. my words here a little bit. But one of the stories is there's a, there's a great book um, by a sociologist named Ofer Sharon. I drop his name because I, I teach it in my intro to sociology class. And the question is, why are these tech workers for a big company, he had to keep it anonymous, but it's a big one that everyone knows. Why do they work 60 to 70 hour weeks? And on average, this is across the right. year. And so, their work level, there, there's like an early part of the year. And then there's kind of trying to make the deliverable. Sprints. Then there's crunch time. Yeah. yeah. And that that's when they're working every day of the week. <laughs> and, um, and, and, Sharon has a nice description of these offices where there is, and this is before work from home was a big thing, but there's a foosball table and, you know, there's a pogo stick in the corner and there's all this silly stuff Segways. and no one's using it. Mm-hmm. It's there. No one's using it. And they're in their offices sending each other emails to each other right. down the hall, <laughs> right work in their, you know, no yeah. one had time for that stuff. Mm-hmm. That was stuff that used to kind of lure people and make it look glamorous. It's also very gendered stuff, by the way, mm-hmm. we can talk about that mm-hmm. later. But uh, so that stuff is there, but the, the, the reality of the work schedule is it, it's, it could be brutal. And uh, if you're a father, uh, if you have a family, you have different kinds of obligations, that work schedule makes it really hard. Yeah. And so it's a young person's game. I'm sure these TikTok videos aren't by people in their 50s. That's true. Hey there, students of the impossible. It's your fearless host, Professor Brian Keating. Hope you're enjoying this conversation with my fellow professor at UCSD, John Scrantney. And I wanted to make a small request, which is for you to make sure that I'm not wasting my education and wasting my time with these wonderful videos that I know you're enjoying, but I found out only 50% of you are subscribed or following the podcast on audio or video format. So please make sure to subscribe and share it with your friends, leave a comment, subscribe, like, do all those things that really helps me out and makes me sure, makes me convinced that I'm not wasting my time. You know, I get so little feedback. This is one of the ways that you can give me some free feedback. It doesn't cost you anything. And I hope it's part of your continuing education. Now back to the podcast. That is true. And so when we look at the, you know, so-called leaky pipeline, I was always told the leaky pipeline leak starts in eighth grade, seventh Mm -hmm. grade, sixth grade, et cetera. You're making the case it starts basically, you know, I call it, I went to 22nd grade, you know, four years of (laughs) undergrad, six years of PhD. Where should, if you have a limited amount of duct tape, which is how we experimental Uh, physicists fix everything, mm -hmm. where do you apply it? You're you're, you're in charge of the NSF or uh, whatever NIH budget for stopping the leak in the pipeline, where do you apply it? That is, it's a great question. And what I wanted to do is I kind of play dumb in the book and I'm like, (laughs) all right, people, let's see what's going on. You claim, right. (laughs) Yeah, you say there's a shortage and let's see if you're acting like there is a shortage. Let's see if you're saying these STEM grads are so valuable and they're 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 to be prized and coveted and polished and and put in the meditation pod and and given a catered lunch. And let's see if in aggregate you're actually acting like you value them. And there's almost no evidence. I mean, there's going to be some sectors that get hot. AI, generative AI, super hot right, right. now. When the price of oil is really high, RNA, oil and gas, right. uh, RNA research, right? right. Yeah. yeah, some of these things will be, yeah, yeah, RNA mm-hmm. research will be really hot, and so you're going to get these spikes, and you're going to hear about, oh, this guy retired in his 30s, and all this kind of stuff. We're talking aggregate on average. We're trying to understand why 60 percent or so of STEM grads do something else. And I'm getting excited and forgetting what the question was. Oh, where would you apply the duct tape? <laughs> oh, the duct tape. Yeah. So yeah. you got to look at the employers, mm. and. And research shows from economists and and sociologists and other social scientists, students pay attention to the market signals. And if the employers are not hiring, they move and do something else. The tricky thing with STEM is often they'll hire young people, certainly in software developing and areas like that. But then these workers will burn out and they'll go do something else. So my argument is, yes, there is a leaky pipeline at eighth grade. Mm-hmm. Fractions is a big one. A lot mm-hmm. of kids have trouble with yeah. fractions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, that's like third grade or fourth grade. So there's Six all these- fourths of people know that. 
<laughs> so there's all these little points where you you might lose some folks, mm -hmm. but then you've been you've got these people who actually graduated from college with a STEM degree. They represent the greatest investment, both personal, yeah. their family, and the government. And then when they go do something else, that I think is the right. urgent thing. And I argue the employers have to be held accountable. And really, it's. I, I sort of make the case that the employers, they have a lot of self-inflicted wounds if they really believe there's a shortage. I mm -hmm. have no lie detector, right. but they act like they, they believe there's a shortage. The investors also kind of drive their behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's a complicated, this is one of the things that, reasons I love sociology. You've got all these complicated systems sort of working together and you know, you've got to draw these connections out and, and to understand this outcome. And investors drive this behavior that that encourages them to treat workers like they're expendable. Mm. Stock prices go up when a firm announces layoffs. Right. Elon Musk went into Twitter and said, we want hardcore people. Right. Let's get rid of all these engineers. All these other CEOs applauded. Right. Yeah, heads meta, are rolling. Meta stock prices tripled. And the stock price went up. People layoffs. love it. So we take the multiple and then you just subtract off the, you know, this cost and you multiply now by this huge number on a, on a the formerly even larger number and they get, yeah, stock price go up. Right. So, so there, it, it's a complicated system there, but, but my argument is if we just keep investing in STEM education and do not pay attention to what the employers do, I'm trying to, maybe you can help me. I'm trying mm -hmm. to think of the right metaphor. I, I took, <laughs> took my kids to a petting zoo over the weekend oh, nice. and I imagined moving more animals into a petting zoo but there's a back gate open and they're walking out. Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not too <laughs> flattering for a STEM grad, but when, when you're filling it in with more and more folks and, right. and then huge numbers are leaving, right. some of them, some studies show about 50% of engineering grads leave before they even gotten their first job. They, they go through the whole yeah. gauntlet and then they say, nah, yeah. I'm going to go do something not, else. Not a lot. And it made me think of, well, here's another alternative. Um, so I had last year, this uh, gentleman, I, uh, He's got a name. I'll, I'll let you guess what what you do if you had a name Hazard. Uh, <laughs> would you what kind of profession would you take on? You know, would it be poetry laureate or he's a fighter pilot? Okay, so he oh, flies for the Air Force. I would have thought risk management or <laughs> yeah. insurance. Well, this is a book about risk management. <laughs> but in here, he goes through the uh, training program that he went through from the Air Force Academy all the way up to, and they force you after after graduation you don't have a choice it's not like they've invest they invest something like five to ten million dollars per pilot and these are the best pilots on earth and, and so forth. they can't they don't have the option it's a legal contract and i'm wondering you know just to be provocative again before we get to judging the book uh, <laughs> i've shown another book before i show this one yeah uh, a, but it's what about teaser. like some you know you get this fellowship you're you know we we you know sponsored by the national science foundation for six years to get a phd and then you decide you want to open a coffee shop you know in uh in selma up in san francisco you know mm -hmm. is that really fair i mean have you betrayed some part of the social contract one of the more interesting findings that i did uh, during the research for this with, with a colleague is we looked at job satisfaction and we looked at job satisfaction of STEM grads who moved to non-STEM jobs. And it was they were statistically significantly less likely to say they were satisfied. Mm. And, and the thing that stood out was they, they asked different things about pay and promotion and stuff. The intellectual challenge of the job, that mm. was the one. They were bored. Yeah. And they were trained to love STEM. And now they're doing non-STEM, right. probably for the money. And one of the arguments I make is you can make a lot more money with oh, yeah. STEM skills in, in a non-STEM job. My students that went on to work for Amazon and eBay, they make twice what you and I make. Right, <laughs> right. Don't remind me. <laughs> um, but uh, so you've, you've got this, yeah, you've got this situation where, um, where the, well, they'll go, they'll go and, and chase the money and, and do something else. And, you know, that, that explains part of the story. Yeah. Okay, so let's do the the judging this book by its cover. So take us through, John, take us through, if you would, the title, Wasted Education, and the subtitle, and then this uh, magnificent cover art. I, I want to commend you for, you know, it's the first sociology book I've probably ever read in my life. <laughs> uh, it's really very interesting. I mean, I had so much fun reading it, and uh, there's a, a lot of hard data in it and hundreds of references at the end of very scholastic. But it's it's written from the perspective of kind of, you know, a travelogue. A, a, a Marco Polo is exploring this question that we all take for granted. Oh, we need more STEM. I've had on right. Michael Saylor, who's, you know, probably the foremost Bitcoin advocate in the world, MicroStrategy. And you know he started a whole university, online university, just for STEM. It only does STEM, called uh -huh. Sailor Academy. And he says we need a million STEM graduates. Uh -huh. And I'm like thinking of forwarding him this book. So take us yeah. through the book, the cover title, subtitle, and art, please. Yeah. Okay. So the title um, actually 
comes from a title that was suggested to me by Sean Carroll, who you might yeah. know in the podcast. Past guest world. many yeah. times. Yeah. yeah. And He's so one of my official first guests uh, during COVID. Yep. <laughs> so Sean and I've known each other since graduate school. And, um, and I wanted to write a book a little bit more accessible and to a mainstream audience because I know a lot of students, parents, a lot of folks interested in this, you know, wanted to reach the policymakers. And so, and Sean's great at writing books that reach a mass audience as, as is yourself. And so I, I asked for a suggestion and I told him what the book was about and he suggested Wasted Brains. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the publisher, I ended up going with an academic publisher yeah, in Chicago. the end, but uh, University of Chicago yeah. Press is one of the best ones for, yeah. for my field. Um, they thought that was, I think, what, are the, what was the word? I think they said too visceral or something, or they, they didn't want people to think of like a brain, brain. in a vat or something. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Or like the we brain, got the right, brain right, right there, that's right. <laughs> and it actually made sense to make it about education because that's where the government's investing its money. This new Chips and Science Act, yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars invested in education. Wow. So it made sense to make it, to switch it to wasted education. So, and then the subtitle, How We Fail, I wanted, I had a big debate about whether to use STEM in the title. Um, I, I talked to some friends of mine, some of them had PhDs. They didn't know what, they hadn't heard that acronym. It's and, only since 2001. I never knew right, that. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Until I read this. Um, I thought it was for a long time. Me I mean, too. Well, in STEM, right? Me too. It, it, it used to be SMET. Oh, right. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> it would better if it, yeah, you in there, like for undergraduate. <laughs> and and I, I used to do historical, I, there was SET, which where they dropped out the T entirely. Um, so there was all these different things, but then STEM just took off. Mm. We decided to just spell it all out there. And, and then there was a debate with my editor, Elizabeth Branch Dyson, who's awesome. I, I wanted to make it how employers fail, the graduates in science, technology, engineering, and math. And and she thought that sounded too narrow. It, it it sounded a little too technical. And and let's let's think of it as a collective problem, you know, because everyone's kind of involved in this. And so so we went with that. Mm. The cover was the second choice. The first cover had uh, a STEM degree going through a paper shredder. And I thought that was a little too <laughs> strong. Yeah. And and I do think I move away from my degree. <laughs> right. I didn't know. bring my paper shredder. But uh, I thought that that was too strong. And I, I think STEM education is great. I think I think the people who move out of STEM and do something else, it's still valuable to have these STEM skills. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to. That, that was too strong. And I didn't really like the art. So right. I said, we can have these sort of generic symbols of science tools and engineering. And yeah. Tools of the trade. But uh, let's go with something like that. And yeah. I thought. As you can see from my T-shirt and your shirt, black made it look kind of cool. Yeah, I think cool. <laughs> Usually black is reserved, as Sean Carroll has pointed out, for astronomy books for some reason. Uh, oh, really? They sell better when they're darker. Oh, oh, so a lot of my books are like, oh, I'm trying to break the trade. <clears throat> um, question for you, maybe uh, slightly tongue in cheek, but like, it, is part of the problem the fact that we have a name for STEM? Like hmm. uh, we're defining, it's like atheism. It's like defining you by what right. you're not, right? So it, it, what do you call, like you don't think of yourself as a non-STEM person. And then a the second part would be, you know, a second follow up to that would be, you know, what what do people that leak out of the pipeline of non stem what do they do? I mean, right. they go into politics. Hey, what are they? Right. What's their wasted education version for the non stem? Right, person? that could be a project actually mm -hmm. in how putting a name on something catalyzes thinking about it and policy making about it. So I had a research assistant, um, Natalie Novick, who looked at bills in Congress and. And she traced how all these bills started to have STEM in the title. And we, we, to do it well, you'd have to have a comparison of ones with science and engineering and this sort of thing. But it really did seem to catalyze and kind of crystallize yeah. a category of what we're talking about here. And so I think there's a mm. there's something okay. to be said. Maybe another astrophysicist yeah, there, will inspire a new book be, for you. Yeah. yeah, there's something to be said <laughs> for that. I wanted to emphasize that the category of STEM is ambiguous to say the least. Mm. And, you know, readers will see this book and it's like 200 pages or so. I had to take out tens of thousands of words where I did a deep dive on what the hell is STEM. Can I say hell? I yeah, just said hell. Yeah. And it's super complicated. So you said that I'm not STEM. Right. The NSF says I am. Really? So how about well, that? You yeah. have NSF grants in it, in fact. Yes, in yes, yes. Research. And they, they, I think, idiosyncratically include the social sciences in STEM. Mm. So, uh, but I think that when most people are talking about why we need STEM, the book starts with this discussion of these rationales for more investments in STEM. The shortage rationale, they're not talking about a shortage of sociologists or economists or anthropologists. 
They're talking. They're not actually talking about cosmologists and astronomers right, either. I'm right. sorry. They're, they're right. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, math. there's and, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, that's I call that the 800 pound gorilla in STEM. F- 50% of STEM workers are in computers in some way. So there's that, and then there's the question of medicine. I don't consider, um, yeah. and the NSF doesn't consider medicine practicing medicine to be STEM. Right. And you might think that's odd because how could you practice medicine without having STEM knowledge? Mm -hmm. But that fits this idea of the shortage rationale. If there's a shortage of physicians and, you know, the AMA has, the American Medical Association has more to answer for there than the education system. There's this kind of complicated story there. And then you have, there's this thing called um, optional practical training. And all the international students listening to this yeah. in America will know what that is. So that well, means yeah. that if you get a degree in the United States and you're foreign, you can you can work in the United States for a year if your job is somehow related to your degree. That's kind of vague as well. But um, if you're in STEM, you can work for three years. And that's because Bill Gates and some other folks lobbied for what's called the STEM extension. So basically what they did was create an incentive for international students to major in STEM. And then that created an incentive for universities to lobby to have different fields categorized as STEM. Wow. So they would get more good international students. And also the international students pay you know, twice the freight of a you know, local it, California state. Right? Exactly. So That's you've got, then the you had first economy, uh, the economics department sort of saying, we, hey, the NSF says we're STEM and we want to say we're STEM. And they... The Department of Homeland Security didn't initially include economics. All kinds of fields, I, I discuss some of them in my books, get classified as STEMs. Classics. <laughs> Classics. I mean, is there anything in NYU? You did a great job lobbying there. Um, if there's anything more like the paradigmatic humanities field, right. anything yeah. more humanities ish yeah. than Escalus classics? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's going to. So they've got, you know, so we created all these incentives to ex- expand the, the, the thing. So the definition of what is STEM could be, we could talk about that. We could do a whole podcast on that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, do, I do use a question. There's this great survey called the National Survey of College Graduates, which says, are you in a STEM occupation, basically? And that's the one that shows that about two thirds of STEM grads are not, about 60% are not, according to my, my analysis of the data, are not in STEM jobs. But then mm-hmm. they can say, does your job require a bachelor's level of STEM expertise? Right. And then you've got a lot more folks. Mm-hmm. So then you get physicians saying, well, heck yeah, I'm using science all the time. And you might get some of those folks going in there. So some of the people who leave STEM are going into medicine. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then others go into management. If, you know, if you're managing a bunch of software developers, right. it makes sense that you have some software backgrounds. They're maybe using some stuff there. I talk about some of my, um, some of my neighbors in the book, you know, this is a big life sciences hub, San yeah. Diego, and they get PhDs in the life sciences and they end up doing stuff, helping firms manage uh, FDA approval or clinical trials, but they're not actually doing bench science. Right. So are they STEM? And so it gets a little bit tricky. So that's why I keep focusing on this shortage rationale, but I, I should emphasize the other, the other three rationales for more STEM education in the book are national competitiveness, which we heard a lot about with the Chips and Science Act, yeah. trying to develop a semiconductor industry in the United States, just trying to develop more folks to innovate and develop more jobs and, and you know, grow the economy for all Americans. Another, another rationale is diversity. Um, if these are great middle class jobs or roads to middle class incomes, then we should open them up to more women and historically underrepresented minorities. Um, and we should utilize all the STEM talent available. You know, we shouldn't make some folks feel unwelcome in science. And then the fourth rationale is the one that I think you and I might share the most, which is save the planet. You know, we're in trouble. All the, all the data indicates climate change, plastic pollution. There's microplastics coursing through our bloodstreams right now. Mm-hmm. Um, we need scientists to come up with better plastics, cleaner energy, better battery storage, better vaccines, all this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of folks, but um, the shortage one I focus on the most because they're the ones who do the most lobbying to get more of the uh, investments in education. Hey there, if you're watching this, you might be a STEM student yourself. And if so, you're guaranteed to win one of these beauties, a real life meteorite, a fragment of the 4.3 billion year old early solar system. You can get one at briankeating.com list. 
But if you have a .edu email address, go to briankating.com slash edu, and you're guaranteed to win one of these beauties if you live in the United States. So please do go over there, sign up, and I'll share with you some of the most incredible science findings every single week for free in your inbox. Unsubscribe at any time, although I hope you won't. And now back to the episode. You quote from uh, past guest and friend um, Antonio Garcia Martinez, who wrote uh, oh. Chaos Monkeys and is a friend of mine. Uh, you say the culture is what kept the 23 year old. Uh, who were make 23 year olds were making half a million dollars a year in a city where there are lots of fun to offer if you have the cash tethered to corporate campuses for 14 hour days. They ate three meals a day there. Sometimes they slept there and did nothing but write code. So um, that seems like a hellscape. You know, it seems like you're, you're earning all this money and um, and what what could really be done to do it to, to you know, to differentiate yourself. St uh, Antonio actually has a degree from f in physics from Berkeley or studied physics at, at Berkeley. So he had a true STEM degree. Uh -huh. He kept going with it and now he's not in and he's writing a newsletter or doing a podcast or whatever he's doing and writing books but the the question of like purpose i mean a lot of what you and i do is is you know we get rewarded not only you know in terms of monetary compensation it's it's camaraderie it's feeling like we're making a difference and but are those things like incentives lacking from the co classic corporate you know environment where a stem you know professional or stem graduate might enter the workforce yeah so i I didn't finish my my thought, which is typical, <laughs> on the uh, Ofer Sharon thing. Yeah. So he did that. It's so rare for sociologists to get access to, you know, a big corporation like that. Even yeah. to get interview rich people, investors, almost impossible. Yeah. That's why we study so many poor people. <laughs> it's easier to get oh, access to them. They're happy to tell their right. story. But he got access to this big company, and one of the things that he found was that the the workers are managed in a way, Brian, that keeps them. He keeps them excited and working so hard. So the the management technique that that was described in that study, it's called forced ranking, or some call it rank and yank. Mm -hmm. But basically, twice a year, these workers are ranked on a bell curve, and there's no ties. Everyone is ranked on the bell curve, and there's going to be some exceptional folks, some middle of the pack folks, and then some folks who are going to be sent packing. And uh, I was pleased with that middle of the pack and I like pack. That. You could saw my amusement. <laughs> but what he found when he interviewed, he said, he basically, I love it when sociologists do this. Why do you do what you do? Hmm. And they have to explain it to what's basically like an extraterrestrial, yeah. someone who's a total outsider. And the, the, these were ma mainly people in computers that he was talking to. They had trouble explaining why they work so hard. But basically what, it, what was teased out was that they wanted to be in the top ranking. Hmm. I mean... So it's Through their whole yeah. lives, they right. wanted to be in the top ranking. Grading, and helicopter parenting. Yes, and, yeah. and, and now they still want to be in the top ranking. It's, it's, it's yeah. not just humiliating, it's intolerable mm -hmm. even to be mediocre. So you're going to be working hard, you're going to have a lot of anxiety. The more you can be ranked in that top 20% or so, the more likely it is that your manager is going to give you interesting work to do. And, um, and so you want to impress your managers. And the other interesting was these workers had... They didn't, they weren't forced to be in there for that right. time, but they wanted to impress their managers. Mm. And so they wanted to impress their managers, not just with being there a long time, but when the manager comes and says, hey, Brian, we need this software to do this kind of thing. It's got to have this functionality. Um, how soon could you get that done? <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, two months, three months, three months tops. Wow, that sounds great because, you know, Tim down the hall, right. he said a year. So we're going to give you that interesting project. <laughs> and you're, then you're going to think, oh, man, how am I going to do that in three months? You're going to do it by working every day for eight hours. Weeks, yeah. yeah. And so, but it's kind of being manipulated, really. So I have a good, I, I, I use that reading in my intro to sociology class. And I talk to the students, which has a lot of intro. So it's got a lot of STEM majors in there. And we talk about, is this really autonomy? Are they really choosing to work that hard mm. when the managers kind of, arguably manipulating them that that's where it gets a little tricky mm -hmm. to to think like that right so there's different ways of doing this now and some a lot of firms are moving away from this forced ranking but there's other ways of of coaxing this what looks like passion they hire on passion right you know are you passionate about mm -hmm. that right. um and if you're not we're going to manage you so you look to be passionate mm -hmm. there, there's other ways of mm -hmm. kind of doing this and and so it keeps them working so hard and that was kind of built into the culture do you remember it came out of Silicon Valley. Some uh, entrepreneur came up with some kind of protein, vitamin, fiber drink called Soylent. Soylent yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That was because you're too busy to eat. Right. You need a complete meal replacement. Right. Just drink that stuff. Just taken stuff. from the Soylent Green. Exactly. Which is like a human exactly. being. Yeah. A little yeah. tongue in cheek comedy. Spoil, spoil a 50 year old <laughs> movie. <laughs> um, and so the whole premise of that is it's kind of built into the culture now right. to work like crazy. And that also attracts more men, I think, uh, to the workforce yes. and, 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 and the machismo culture. Right. And who can sleep under their desk longer. Right. It makes it harder for if you have a family, if you have other obligations to stick with that stuff. I'm thinking about the chapter on training in the STEM skills uh, treadmill, what you call it. Um, the notion of science to me is one of uh, what's called an infinite game by, you know, uh, game theory sociologists as well, where it's something that, you you know, the object is to keep playing, not to necessarily to win it, unlike chess or, you know, battleship, which I always lose at somehow to my kids. But <laughs> but the point is, um, at least I don't lose in solitaire that often, uh, but but, you know, but I would say science is true. It's an infant. You can't win science. Mm -hmm. Like there's no like, oh, you got to the end of science. Congratulations. Um, even you win a Nobel Prize. Although 20 of my guests have been Nobel Prize winners. They're all to a person, man and woman, uh, working continuously on their craft of science. They mm -hmm. never are satisfied with it. Uh, so what to what extent does the treadmill kind of, you know, when you go to the gym, sometimes in, in the, you pull the emergency. I have to do it probably more than you. You know, pull the emergency, stop. The treadmill just stops, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, you get these kids who are interested in science and I call them kids, but you know, some of them are twenties or whatever, but they love science. They're passionate about mother nature and understanding the world around them, the natural world. Mm -hmm. And then they, they graduate from that environment where they don't really have access to the life of the intellectual, the scholar. It's a very abrupt transition, right? You're going from the life of the mind and, and like studying classics, to sociology, to astrophysics, every day is a new adventure. You're looking up to your professors or so wise, the sages, and then you're slammed into a, you know, where it's like just you're learning from a guy, project managers two years older than you mm -hmm. who went to the same or school. Or younger. Yeah, or younger. <laughs> yeah. And uh, or maybe from another country mm -hmm. and can't relate to this person. And you're not going to learn from, you, you might learn to teach the test of, you know, passing your next, uh, pro, you know, six month annual review or whatever. How, talk about that. Is there kind of a, um, a, a dissatisfaction for the intellectuals that that come out? And I've graduated, all my students are brilliant and they're, they're super curious and, you know, and the ones that go and work for Amazon or eBay or whatever, they're just as smart, curious and, and interested in nature. Yeah. Now they hit this wall where it's just like, okay, so I've got to prepare a five page uh, document on why I'm having this meeting. And it has nothing to do with the life of the mind. Isn't that transition abrupt and sort of unfair? And might that explain why? There's some leakage. Yeah, that's a great question. I it, I ended up cutting this out of the book, but it, to me it was such an interesting and kind of poignant story. Mm. Uh, so basically, it was there was a profile in one of these business magazines, like Fast Company or something mm -hmm. like that, and it was a company that was trying to sell you fashion um, and trying to get you to buy more clothes, basically mm -hmm. from this <laughs> website. So they needed scientists to develop algorithms to figure out what you, Brian Keating, are interested in and like, oh, you don't want that shirt. How about this right. one? And keep you on the, on the app and, and hopefully opening up your wallet or tapping yeah. on your credit card. They hired a PhD in astrophysics. And I thought, oh, man, just like you were thinking, like the life of the mind, there was much more magisterial than thinking about the cosmos. Right. And now you're trying to get people to buy clothes. And this guy... He, I, I admired this to some extent. He thought it was like a cool game. Mm. Like, how do we develop this? Like, it was a it was a scientific puzzle to figure out how to keep people on this website and buying stuff and guessing what they like and all that sort of stuff based on their past their past clicks. And 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 he even used the analogy. He said, "Just like cosmology, this is something I'll think about while taking a shower." <laughs> And I thought that was sad. That was where it was pointing to me yeah. that like he's spending his time off hours thinking about how to get right. people to buy stuff that they don't need. Mm -hmm. That tells you the story or a, one, one thing that's going on here is some people do make this transition. Mm. Some people say, hey, I'm still using my mind. I'm still using computational skills. It's just different subject matter. Other folks, they have trouble with that. And I, I, I included in the book some folks who wrote on Reddit or some of these other sorts of uh, websites where people kind of post their thoughts and questions where they move from real, I call it real science, but you know what I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, to this data analytics kind of stuff. And, and they felt a little sad about it. And one of them, I, I thought this was a, a really another poignant way of thinking about it. He said, I used to do you know, physics or astronomy and at a dinner party, I was really proud to say what I did. And now I'm not anymore. Mm. 
And, and there's a kind of, there was a sadness and then people commented and said, I feel the same way and, and this sort of thing. Right, right, very so, cool, right. Um, so some people do make that transition. I, I admire them who can see the puzzle. Uh, other people can't. And then another uh, theme in the book is that some people feel the moral, I call it STEM education for what? What are we using this these talents for? And investors love, there's a whole section in here, investors love software. They, which they love, they love things that can make a lot of money with no factory. You've got, you can Scalable, show, the, yeah, right you can right. show the product works. The only, so you don't have product uncertainty, you have market uncertainty. And you can do some research and figure out the market, but you don't have to worry about the product that, oh man, this battery doesn't actually store energy the way we thought it did. Oh man, we've got to find a factory. We've got to redo this whole right. setup. And this, yeah, we yeah. One solder joint. They call there. that the valley of death um, <laughs> in investing where it takes years to make money, yeah. where you're not making money and you're bleeding money. But software doesn't really have a value, value of death. And so they love to put money in that. And so that's why so much money goes into stuff that is arguably not helpful or even pernicious. So mm -hmm. I talk a lot about social media. I'm very skeptical of social media. And I talk about workers at Facebook who resigned. One of them memorably said she had blood on her hands because mm -hmm. they were using algorithms that increased conflict and polarization in society. And teen depression. Yeah, and someone, yeah someone else said we're, we're harming people at scale. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's some problematic things there that uh, some folks with great skills might might not feel comfortable doing. Yeah, I remember, you know, just in terms of, you know, like odd applications. I mean, Antonio told me that, you know, one of the projects he worked on it involved like looking at different types of glass for fiber optics such that you can shave off a microsecond from the digital fetch times that they preload the advertiser's bid to this bidding oh, war wow. on, on advertising. So if you could save a millisecond or whatever, that's a huge amount, uh, but even microseconds. He, so he's applying like optics and laws. And it seemed like he was really interested in that. And then they just got him, you know, literally like how many lines of code can you, you know, generate to do this uh, other, you know, pr grading him on these objective metrics rather than creative you know generative new ideas right. um and speaking of you know uh of uh you know kind of software eating the world as Andreessen would say although i point out most of the the biggest top five companies in the world right now you know nvidia now apple mm. uh, even microsoft they're all hardware companies right <laughs> and so so the software has been eaten uh yes it's easy it's cheap i i make fun of my theorist friends i say like theorists are like software that you know it's easy to make thousands of lines of code or come up with ideas that it can never be tested but building an experiment the web telescope you know Ten billion dollars, you know, thousands of, of human lifetimes to build it. Um, sorry, Rina. Yeah, I was just gonna say. So, yeah. I would say Microsoft is a software company, yeah. and Nvidia. I think is. I saw those same headlines as you. I think just it's because of the money going into software, generative AI. Yeah, like that is oh, just sure. massive now, and they make the chip that makes that possible. Right, yeah. So there's a ton of other generative AI companies that are sucking in huge amounts of investment dollars while clean energy companies and stuff that I, I argue that we badly need are are losing money right now. Do we really need like a STEM graduate to do a lot? I mean, the core of these things is called large language models, mm -hmm. right? So to what extent do we really need, you know, computer scientists to develop or to what extent are we on? you know, fairly excluding people from the workspace that could actually bring some novel new approaches to to a longstanding uh, and, and financially lucrative problem like uh, a generative AI. That, that's a great question. And I ended up taking this, another thing that ended up on the cutting room floor um, of the book was a, some research I did on folks who did not have STEM degrees who ended up in STEM jobs. And, and computers and soft, software is specifically yeah. really is a, I use the word porous. It's unlike engineering and, and life sciences, people can enter that field mm -hmm. without a formally technical background, a formal technical background, I should say. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly in the early days of the, uh, the development of a software technology, there's a lot of folks who don't know how to do it and smart people who uh, sometimes I think even having an education in a different field can be helpful. You think differently than other folks. You can enter that field and so, there's different estimates of this, but in, in computers and software, some people say anywhere from 10 to 20% of the workers don't have 
computer science or computer engineering degrees, and they can be successful. Mm -hmm. So I don't know enough about generative AI and, and how that actually is done, but there's enough going on that your hypothesis is a good one. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about it like, uh, you know, I got this new uh, advertisement on Facebook, you know, probably from Antonio's, you know, old, old team. And and it was all, you know, like uh, something like you know, AI, we use AI, you know, to, to fit to your needs. And then at the bottom, it's like Nespresso. I'm like, what? Like, you know exactly like the coffee pod, that we, you know, right. I'm out of it. And I mean, certainly there's a lot of you know, shenanigans that go on behind the phone of these. You know, I mm -hmm. had a spy, famous spy, Andrew Bustamante here last week. And, you know, the stuff that they do and that's totally legal. And, and Apple, you know, sells your data to all these places mm -hmm. and they claim that privacy is a human right. But I mean, they're spending all their time to get these incremental advantages and they're having some of the most brilliant hardworking people that are uh, working on it. But staying on the theme of AI, I mean, uh, will this lead to more or fewer uh, STEM graduates and the necessity for them in the workplace? I mean, is this going to, you know, be the ax that opens up the uh, the flood, you know, the pipeline forever? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's because the software writes itself. I mean, right. it can be used to write itself. Right. So, so it, it seems that people keep predicting that technology is going to eliminate jobs. And, and there's all these case studies where it does not. And one of the more famous ones was on ATMs, yeah. that they thought ATM was going to kill the bank teller. Yeah. And and one of the things that they found was that banks kept bank tellers, but they just had them do other things. So they had them selling other kinds of services. Mm -hmm. Banks started Mortgages. to expand more into credit cards, do other mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. And so these predictions of cataclysmic declines of certain job sectors um, have, have not happened. Brian, I got to tell you, 20 years ago when the MOOC was coming, uh, yeah. that maybe that was a little bit less than 20, that was more like 10 years ago. When the MOOC was coming, I thought, I gotta, I'm going to be selling used cars here in a little All bit. Right, yeah. and, and here we are. Yeah. And so, you know, like, the, you only, a, a massive online. Yeah, massive, a, a massive open online uh, course. course. So uh, online education, basically. So, um, but who knows? I mean, this seems to be a bit of a game changer. I'm, I'm watching this really uh, with, with, with great interest. I did see a study that showed that AI can now write code, but it seems to it, it seems to be more of a tool that helps people. And it helps especially the mediocre coders, mm -hmm. the really excellent coders. It's not really helping that much. Right. So who knows? I've been reading these stories about is AI overhyped and is it is the innovation kind of tapering off and you know i i don't know mm -hmm. i i keep i keep waiting for the whole world to completely change and um and it's just not it's just not happening yet it certainly changed the way i i teach yeah hey there's a good chance you might be a scientist or an engineer aspiring to be maybe going to school graduate school or after school or maybe you're a professor like me if you're wanting to learn the greatest tips and ways to become your best scientist. You might want to get my book, Into the Impossible, Think Like a Nobel Prize Winner, with a foreword by my friend Nobel Laureate, Barry Barish. In it, we describe an incredible series of tips on how to collaborate better, unlock your creative genius, and get over common pitfalls like the imposter syndrome. I hope you'll take a deep dive into it, and I know you'll enjoy it. You can read a free chapter at my website, briankeating.com books. And you can buy it at Amazon.com in ebook, audiobook, or in physical hard copy or paperback form. Thanks a lot. How do you use it? How, how, so how I, it? well, I used to do some, you know, take home exams. And now what is the point? <laughs> a friend of mine said, you should have AI grade the students right. AI generated exams and you all go, exactly. go out go, for a beer, go beer. Um, and uh, or go to the beach in San Diego. Yeah, right. And uh, so, um, I, I go back to the way I did exams, which is the blue book exam, mm. where you wrote with a pen in this thing called a blue book. They still sell them yeah, on campus. They look right. exactly like they did when I was in college Big decades money. ago. And but I, I have to say, I wonder, like, what what should people know when you have access to so much information so easily? What should people know? And I I've kind of gone to the idea that you need to know a lot in order to ask the right questions. So I do think that people taking my courses should know a lot of about society and how it works. Mm -hmm. And I also think that a part of our job is to generate, I call them foundational skills. I hate the term soft skills. It seems pejorative or kind of insulting. No. Foundational skills, critical thinking, communication. That's usually right. a soft skill. You're not going to survive long in the work world if you can't communicate well, right. writing well, 
teamwork, collaboration. I'm building a more of that into my teaching so that um, students can have long careers relearning. Everyone's going to be on a STEM skills treadmill or at least a skills treadmill, and it's going to go faster and faster, and you're going to need to reboot. And people are going to need that kind of be able to pivot and learn things quickly on a on a foundation of, of solid skills that I hope they pick up in college. Mm. So, yeah, it, I, it's hard to say what's going to happen with AI to bring back to your original question. But we, I think we need to prepare people for a world of constant change and more rapid change. If you could go back in time and you know change from your STEM profession, which I now know is a STEM profession. <laughs> I, I, I would never. I, I, I presented and I kind of roll my eyes as I say that. What would you do differently? Would you would you still want to you know be an academic? Would you, has has things you know align more with what your core you know desires and competency are, or have they changed maybe for the worse? And I, you're tenured, so you can speak freely. We have great jobs. You know that. I've heard you say that. Um, we have so great it's jobs. the hardest three-hour week job in the world. <laughs> it's great to be able to learn about the world. I often think of it as like exploring where I'm planting. A, there's an area I don't know. Yeah. And now I'm going to learn about it. And then I'm planting a flag. And now I know this area. That's what this book is. It's just travel along. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I, 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 honestly, one of my favorite parts was learning investing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not here to give investment advice. <laughs> but learning how investors think. And, and I'm kind of a cultural sociologist and, you know, economists hate culture that you can't study it. It's so vague. Quantify. Yeah. Right, right. You want quantifiable Measure stuff. Measure what you can manage. Right? Culture, ma it matters massively. And I highlight in the book when these, when these investor, these management professors talk about the norms of investing. They're, it's kind of governed by norms of different kinds. And so I, 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 I love what I do. And, and so it's, it's hard to tell people not to try to do this. I have mm -hmm. students come to me just like they come to you. Mm -hmm. Should I try to be a professor? I say, you know, shoot for the stars, but have, a, have an exit plan mm -hmm. is, is basically what I say. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's fun to be able to do this. It's fun to be able to talk to, uh, talk to you about this and, um, and try to share these ideas. And hopefully these ideas get out there. And students who are STEM majors, I'm, I'm not saying don't be a STEM major. I'm saying have an exit strategy. Mm -hmm. Pick up these other skills. Learn to learn to write, learn to think critically, learn to communicate to people outside of your technical That's field. Right. That is going to serve you well for a long-term career. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there are very few actual, honest to goodness, real professors that have podcasts. <laughs> And, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, you know, kind of asked, well, you know, UCSD must give you a lot of resources and money. And I'm like, no, actually, I bought all this stuff on my own dime. <laughs> and they said they wouldn't, you know, can me for doing it, but they're not going to like support even for my books. I, in physics, it wasn't like it's part of uh, academic discipline that we're supposed to write a book. So I was told I asked for a sabbatical and they said, no, we won't uh, deny you, you know, promotion. <laughs> That's as good as it's going to get. So it's different in your field. I know it's very important to write, to write in your field, to yes, write ac academic, is, but non academic. This Go is ahead. Yeah. Right. This is what I mean by culture. Yeah. Like your field can't exist without donors and taxpayers. That's right. And if there aren't if there aren't people communicating why what you're doing is significant, it's going to dry up. It's yeah. like why why should we let these people gaze at their navels right. on our dime? Screw that. Let's let's put and our money. Think, oh, you know, big NASA's got all this money, and then yeah. oh, I see Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's very popular. He's very rich. You know, it must be that you guys are pretty well funded. And I say no, actually. I believe, and I say this and I get a lot of grief online, but but I think it's our moral obligation as scientists to explain to the public in terms they can understand what it is that we do. I mean, imagine we work for, you know, the chancellor or whatever, and they say, hey, John, what are you working on? Oh, what I'm doing is very specialized. Yeah, you yeah. can't possibly understand it. Yeah, <laughs> Pretty, and, and there's no way because I'm using equipment that, no, you'd be gone. Oh, well, I mean, right. in our field, you would be gone. But if you work for Google or Facebook and you try to do that, oh, well, what are you working on this, uh, you know, the recent Slack sprint that I said, no, you can't understand it. You'd be gone. On, right? Exactly. It's part of its communication, but it, but it's also the the resistance that I get is no, actually, STEM people shouldn't be doing that because they should be doing the stuff that uniquely the only they can do, which is STEM stuff in the lab. Or and I say also, well, why is that? Well, why is it? Well, it's also hard for me to learn the soft skills. Like I'm not good at it. And I say, well, oh, yeah, I know. You know, quantum mechanics. You were born learning it out of the womb. Like it's so easy for you. You got uh -huh. it in third grade. No, you had to study things that were valuable to you and that were meaningful to you that you derive value from. So why is it different with presentation? Now, I don't think everyone should do it, but but the the point 
point is we should we should teach it. That should be part of our of our discipline at least. That these are critical skills. They're not even like you know soft or unimportant. They're critical for everything that's that's meaningful and important. You know, it's 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 vastly important. And I, I think it's underrated. I agree 100. It, it, a lot of what you say translates to the social sciences as well. You could be a you could be a social scientist where your whole life is consumed with arguing with other people about which theory is better to explain something, and what is the point? Yeah, <laughs> and um, and it's. I mean, we. Do, I, I agree with you 100. percent We do have a moral obligation to use this knowledge to, in your case, I think advance civilization. I think you and Sean do stuff to advance civilization or understanding of the cosmos. For other folks to improve society, to make society function better, to work better, that's what we. That's what we should be doing. But yeah, you could you could spend your time just arguing with with like 10 other people about some very narrow thing that only <laughs> right. that's what 10 people care about. Exactly. And, and, and sometimes, you know, my paper, like uh, my median paper cited 12 times, you know, mm -hmm. maybe 20 people have read it, you know, books, 15,000 people allegedly bought it. Right. So it's, it's, you know, it's, de it's decent kind of leverage. And then in these YouTube videos, I mean, for like 10 to you know thousand people might watch this video. Right. As, as we wrap up, I wanted to ask you about your other research. So you conduct something called the uh, Center for Comparative Immigration Studies, and you're the director, you're the co-director of that, and you're the director of the Yankelovich Center for Social Science Research. What are these things? I'm so, I didn't know about them. Yeah. You said you've never been to this building. Well, but, I've never heard, been to or heard of these institutions. So it, it's funny. Me. So there's these, the university tries to create interdisciplinary work. The disciplines are still these siloed powerhouses that really kind of run the show, but right. the university knows that, and not just ours, but a lot of others, know that a lot of the more interesting work gets done when you bring people across fields. And so these these research centers, they're called organized research units. And I actually, when I was, I'm no longer directing these things, mm. but um, when I was directing the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies, I would meet with the folks who, who run most of them are in the hard sciences yeah, and engineering it's research. Yeah, yeah. now it's a department. Yeah. yeah. So there was someone I remember because I asked, we would come together and we'd ask each other questions. Yeah. I asked why they're still building these land based telescopes when you have these these ones right. in outer space. Wow. And they told me, and maybe you can confirm this, that now the computers can correct for all the distortions that the atmosphere Hardware, creates. Not, not just the computer, but yeah, it's critical. You build basically these wobbly mirrors that do what's called adaptive optics. So yeah. you correct for the fact that we look through this dirty window called the atmosphere and it's turbulent and fluctuating. And you basically m make a mirror that it compensates for that exact uh, equal and opposite fluctuations. Yeah. yeah, It was invented by uh, Claire Max, who's a professor up at UC Santa Cruz. She was, yeah. So the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies was, was a center uh, created years ago, uh, and it was designed basically to look at how immigration works in different places, and it does work very differently. And one of the things that interested me, this is one of these puzzles that I had to know the answer to. Mm -hmm. We always hear about how great immigration is yeah. and how immigrants are necessary to build the economy and right. all this. They do the jobs we don't want to do. Yeah, and, um, and I was interested in how Japan, which up until recently was the second largest economy in the world, right had the second largest economy in the world with a Very third strict, of, right. a third as many people as us and almost no immigrants yeah. and so i got some money for them from the japan foundation they had this thing called the center for global partnership to do a conference where we asked that question is immigration necessary and we compared japan and the us and that's what got me on the road to wasted education because yeah. um we invited some scholars in to talk about low-skilled immigration and high-skilled immigration and uh, some of the folks talking about the U.S. blew my mind mm -hmm. with this statistic that only a third of STEM grads worked in STEM jobs. Like, and I was like, what? what? Right. <laughs> and, you know, I'm I scribbling no down. Right, I'm yeah. like, what? <laughs> and, I, and that was years ago. And I was like, I got to find the answer to that. So um, and then the Yankelovich Center, there was a donor um, who lived in San Diego, Dan Yankelovich, wonderful guy. I had the pleasure of knowing him, who, who basically gave some money to UCSD to catalyze research to make the world better mm -hmm. in any kind of hmm. any kind of area not hard sciences no, sorry no, we're no, starved no. for money you guys are <laughs> no. swimming in money oh, yeah. dust. Oh, so no, no, different no. kinds of social science projects to improve education to improve employment outcomes and all sort of stuff like that so um that's kind of a job that eats your whole life though and it takes away from writing books like this. And yeah. so I'm not doing that anymore. I'm working on this and I'm doing another project. I'm really interested in this idea of the STEM skills treadmill and the way that these workers have to constantly rebuild. And And a lot of folks leave because of that, by yeah. the way. The, the whole chapter on training is about how a lot of the workers 
they get tired of having to be on this treadmill, just moving to keep in place to keep their job. And a lot of the better ones leave. They say, screw this. I can make more money doing something where I'm not constantly right. having to learn the next software that comes down the pike. So, um, so I'm really interested in how adults, mid-career adults, retool and rebuild their university, or re rebuild their sort of skill portfolio and how research universities like ours can help them. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, do you teach undergrads? Yeah. Yeah. So, so teaching undergrads, there's a lot of folks, um, a lot of Republicans especially want these kind of work ready, you know, bachelor, they got a bachelor's and you're ready to be plug and play and go into the workforce. I, I think if you do that, the skills are going to change and then they're, they're, they're lost. It, they're very fragile. Mm -hmm. And and so if we focus on what we're doing with the undergraduate stuff is prepare them for a lifetime of skills changes. And then mid-career, you can come back. You don't need a whole degree. You can just get a certificate of some kind mm -hmm. in, in generative AI kinds mm -hmm. of things, some yeah. kind of software Cyber language security that becomes hot. Right, Cybersecurity, right. huge one. And, um, and so I'm working on a book on that and how these different kind of regionally focused universities I was talking with the University of Texas. They do a lot of stuff on oil and gas and mm. data analytics and that and clean energy over there. Yeah. Um, the University of Michigan, they have a whole segment on mobility and electric cars, self-driving cars, battery storage for cars, for mid-career engineers to learn about these new technologies, right? Wow. So that's what I'm trying, that's that's the book I'm working on now and I'm yeah. super excited yeah, about it, as you can excellent. see. Well, you are the epitome, as I used to say, epitome of a scholar, in my opinion. You're doing research cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, following your curiosity leads, and it's actually incredibly valuable work. I mean, just as you're saying it, we hear a lot about like, oh, we need all these STEM skills, but but also we need, you know, tradesmen and women and doing yes. stuff, you know, plumbing. Yeah, ever try to get your your, your faucet fixed? And, <laughs> you know, there's a joke that my uh, late great mentor Jim Simons used to say. He was a hedge fund manager, billionaire, you know, and he said once he hired somebody, came over a plumber in the middle of the night to fix something. And uh, and the plumber said that after ten seconds that'll be you know that'll be six hundred dollars. Right. And Jim said, "What are you talking about? I, I don't I don't even make six hundred dollars." And the plumber uh, per 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 second or whatever you make. And the plumber said, well, "What do you do?" And he goes, "Well, I'm a hedge fund manager. I manage Renaissance Technologies." And uh, and uh, the plumber said, "Oh, well, yeah, I guess I used to make that when I was a hedge fund manager too." <laughs> so, uh, which is one of the professions that STEM graduates leak out of. And I yeah. even know some professor, oh, yeah, uh, professors yeah. that have left our field of astronomy and gone to work for. Uh, so we have to stem the STEM flow, uh, but uh, but, it, Nicely but it's done. thanks to Nicely uh, done. You were saving working this book. One. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't bring up steam. I, I, oh, my, yeah. My artist friends always want to throw in an A there. Now you got your own things. Yeah, know, yeah. Let, 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 you know, I, leave I us have, alone with your I applaud acronyms. their effort, but but the investment is... Yeah, yeah. I, I think that actually helps a lot. But yeah, Congress isn't like trying maybe, to put money uh, in a future book. Maybe yeah, uh, an astrophysicist can inspire it. John uh, Scranton, thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. This incredibly enthralling book. Everyone should go out and get a copy. People can find you on Twitter at uh God, X, X. At, at at John Scranton. Yeah, at John Scranton. But I, I don't tweet that often. I know. But yeah. um, but yeah, stop by. Please That's stop great. by. It's great. Yeah. It's great to have you on this campus. Yeah. Thanks thank so, so much, much, Brian. This is fun. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. If you watched all the way to the end, I know you're going to love this interview with visionary genius Peter Diamandis, who's thought a lot about STEM and its impact on society. And click here for a playlist, my greatest episodes in the past few weeks.